good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so this uh, is a discussion or presentation about the OSDU data platform architecture. Uh, this was originally done by Stephen on May 18th, but uh, seems like due to some scheduling issues, a lot of people couldn't joining uh, could join. Uh, so I am repeating this uh, on, on his request. Um, quick antitrust, um, we shall not discuss or exchange information related to the following, companies proprietary or confidential information, prices of products, purchasing plans, or any other company specific um, aspects. So with that said, um, let's get into this. Um, what we're gonna uh, do is we're gonna establish a, a series of these uh, talks to make sure that everybody in the community understands uh, what's going on with the OSD data platform. And as we move into R3 and, and, and subsequent evolutions, there are new components and, and uh, services that are coming online. So this may be a, a good way to bring everybody up to speed, right? So this is sponsored by the EA and, and PMC. And the plan is that we will have this uh, as a one hour session every two weeks uh, in the same slot uh, that we have uh, right now. Uh, so the initial one is sort of a general overview of the architecture of the platform. Um, we also have another one coming up two weeks from now uh, to talk about uh, ingestion and uh, a generic ingestion framework. Uh, Google team has been uh, working on, and we will try to schedule more presenters uh, across the different uh, development organizations uh, to make sure that uh, you know we can build this as a strong community. Um, the link there on the screen, uh, I've also put that into the chat window, so that's where we will keep track of um, the slides and, and materials that we are presenting here. Uh, and I've been talking to Judy and, and Dennis to get this thing recorded. So we will have this on, on YouTube as well. So, you know, for those of you who have missed it or you want to share it with your peers, colleagues, whatever, you will be able to do that. Uh, key thing to note is uh, this is um, a, a presentation session where the development team comes and tells you about what they are implementing. Uh, this is not a EA discussion session. Right, so this is not where we're going to, you know, architect on the fly, uh, but more to understand the, the current status and, and plans and what the designs and APIs look like. So with that said, um, this one is a, a kickoff um, for the uh, the series, and so what I wanted to do today was to give you a functional uh, architecture of the overall data platform. So it's not going to get into the details of any of the individual services or implementation, but gives you a, a broad spectrum. Uh, and keep in mind that this is really just the functional portion of it. Um, there are also things around, you know, validation, certification, documentation, operation, security, et cetera. So these are things that we will uh, schedule as subsequent sessions. Uh, and a lot of these are, are also in the R3 uh, played. So, you know, we were really developer ready with, with R2. Uh, so some of these features are not as mature uh, today to, you know, get into much more details than that. So then let's introduce the uh, OSD data platform. Some of you may have seen the slides from the virtual face-to-face -face, uh, meetings as well. Uh, so this basically shows you the data flow and the different aspects that we need to think about. Uh, so the flow goes from sort of uh, left to right, if you will. Um, the security and operations are more of the, the cross-cutting things that uh, serves the, uh, the whole platform. Anytime we bring in data from any external source, be it a file, a database, a national data center, a vendor data source, whatever the case may be, uh, we need to make sure that there is uh, governance that's uh, put into the data. This means tagging the data, making sure that this is compliant uh, um, for retention, it's compliant for access and delivery. So that is sort of a, a precursor stage to uh, what we would call ingest. Uh, so once the data lands up in the cloud, how do we then parse this? How do we understand the, the format of the data? and extract the metadata that is necessary for uh, discovery. So that's the next phase, which is using that uh, metadata to provide rich capabilities of discovering the data that is there within the OSD. 
And uh, one of the tenets that we've, we've taken in this case is a scheme on read principle. So what that means is, um, you know, we want to keep track of um, how the source data and then enrich that within the platform uh, to create whether this is a, a canonical uh, model for um, discovery and access or a consumption model that may be more suited for the workflows that you see on top. So, for example, the perspective for a piece of data that you may need in a field development workflow may be different than unconventional or you know, well delivery or production or something like that. So uh, those are enabled by uh, the phase that we're calling uh, enrichment. So ingestion is about um, teasing apart the data, extracting the structure, but preserving it in a source form. Uh, enrich is the sequence of transformations that is necessary to bring the data into a, a consumption ready format. And across all of this, we need to think about, you know, authentication, authentication of the user, authentication of the calling app or the service, uh, authorization uh, or data entitlements uh, to make sure that only the, the right person receives the data. So this goes hand in hand with the governance as well. So the tags that we've put in at the point when we ingest, we need to make sure at the point of access, uh, we are verifying that as well. So uh, if there are TCC, embargo, other legal considerations for access for a particular uh, use case or an individual, uh, those are enforced uh, at the point of uh, access. And then last but not the least, all of this is sort of the functional portion of the architecture. Uh, how do we deploy this? How do we keep this environment refreshed? Uh, how do we monitor it? How do we secure this from an operations perspective? Um, how do we uh, think about um, service level indicators, service level um, assurances, SLAs? Uh, those are all the aspects that come into play in, from an operations perspective. So the platform needs to provide the um, the right level of uh, capabilities to be able to hook in these operational uh, tools and procedures into the platform. So that's roughly the, the, the high level view of this. Uh, what you see down below is basically the different uh, domain optimized uh, stores uh, that these services would then operate on. And, and these are typically, uh, you know, services that would come in from the underlying um, cloud provider or the on-prem uh, provider uh, from an infrastructure perspective. So, um, just to put that in the context of a data flow, uh, what you're seeing here is the, the first step that we talked about, which is bringing in the data as is and, and tagging it. Uh, so that's the upload phase, if you will. So you're making the data ready for the cloud. And once the data is in the cloud repository, that's when the Ingestion platform uh, service takes over. And what that does is to parse this from the storage and uh, it moves the file, uh, if it was a file-based ingestion, into a persistent file storage. Uh, if it's array data, then it may optimize the array data storage into specialized storage. And then the metadata that it extracted, it puts it into a, a, a data store. Think of it as a JSON document store, um, for lack of a better term. So at this point, the data is now readable. And then what we do is we then make the data available in a discovery sense by publishing it into different types of indexes. Uh, what we have now is a search index um, that's based on Elastic. And what that allows you to do is to take the metadata that you've extracted into the data store and make that uh, searchable and accessible um, for the and then um, once you have that, that's sort of the, the basic of it. So effectively at that point, you could directly consume the data within your target application or service. Um, but if you needed to further enrich the data, improve its quality, curate the data, et cetera, those are all things that would be done as part of the enrichment um, um, service portion of the uh, platform. And then, of course, on the consumption side, you may be thinking about, you know, additional caches for uh, the data and so on. So that's what the operation store and the delivery services. So that's how roughly the data is being um, brought in into the system and consumed. And any data that is then produced by an OSDU-based application or service uh, effectively follows that loop all the way back. Uh, so it, it goes back through the ingestion, indexing, enrichment, and, and delivery steps. So 
that's the, the sort of 50,000 feet view. Um, let's look at a few core principles for the data platform that helps you understand the design before we get into the functional architecture itself. So on the data side of things, um, we put these into four categories. Um, the first one is value all data. So like I said, we want to minimize the friction on ingestion. We want to preserve all of the data. We want to avoid a schema on right principle and transform and lose uh, valuable data at the point of ingestion. So any data that's brought in is uh, preserved in source schema. Uh, the data is uh, immutable. The data needs to be secured, and we talked about this already, which is uh, the entitlements and the compliance and the authentication of the user of the application. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the platform hangs together, provides the right level of uh, discovery, the consumability of the data. So what that means is data needs to be globally identifiable. It needs to have enough attributes that makes it discoverable. And uh, the framework needs to provide the support that makes it consumable in different personas, workflows, or domains, respectively. And last but not the least, from a um, data management, data context uh, perspective, uh, we want to establish and, and continuously improve the data. And what that means is uh, to um, be able to provide uh, data quality uh, capabilities on consumption. Uh, there's already some work that's uh, being done in terms of quality tagging and so on. Um, and in combination with the immutable principle of the data, any enriched data becomes uh, new data uh, that is then linked back into the source data. So effectively you have the lineage and you have the enriched data and you have an ability of going from the enriched data to the source data uh, if you were trying to understand the, the context uh, in which the data was processed by the platform. So those are some of the data principles uh, from a software or system design principles. We want to uh, favor agility. So what that means is, uh, you know, we're not building a monolith here. These are microservices architectures, uh, which means continuous integration, continuous delivery is, is really key. Uh, with R3, uh, you can find on the, uh, the community um, wiki, we've uh, listed the number of projects and, and who's working on each of the projects. So we have uh, autonomous teams, but teams that are aligned on, on the, the core uh, principles of the platform. Uh, and of course, uh, these teams are working with the, the standards team for the architecture or data definitions or information security to make sure that the platform is aligned with the, uh, with the uh, uh, goals. Uh, security, that's, that's absolutely key. Uh, we're tapping into expertise of the community, the cloud service providers uh, to make sure that uh, whether this is data encryption at flight, data encryption at rest, um, the, the deployment of the services, uh, doing static code scans, uh, protecting the, um, the API endpoints, authentication, authorization, compliance, et cetera. So all of those are, are concerns that we look at from a security perspective. Um, and given that this is a, uh, an operational service, we also need to think about this from a DevOps perspective. So as operators deploy these, uh, how do we provide the hooks in the platform uh, for um, logging, for monitoring, for um, operational support, uh, Canary releases, um, uh, establish fault tolerant patterns. So you know you can you can bring in new services online with minimal interruptions, um, and also to improve the efficiency of the delivery team. Uh, we've taken uh, a few uh, lightweight architecture decision records or ladders uh, and what these are are some principles that we've agreed upon um, with the, the PMC and the contributors and the committers within those uh, teams uh, to make sure that, for example, you know, what are the languages, what are the frameworks, uh, what are the design principles that we want to keep in mind. So from a DevOps perspective, the, the environment that you're deploying into becomes uh, more uh, manageable and maintainable. Um, last but not the least, on the poly cloud side, um, you know, obviously we know that uh, different operators that are consuming this or uh, having different choices of uh, public cloud or, or even in-country type of uh, deployments. So, 
uh, we do want to support this in a polycloud manner, but at the same time, we don't want to dilute it to a point that we always go for the lowest common denominator and the cloud providers are not able to provide that differentiation. So this is gonna be one of those things where we strike the balance between the lowest common denominator approach versus a common code platform uh, approach in an elegant manner. And of course, where we can, we um, leverage other uh, open source projects and, and APIs uh, as possible. Given those data and system principles, now let's go back to the same uh, picture that we saw before and look at it from an API perspective for each of these services and see where we were with um, release two and what are some of the, um, the top things that we're working on from a release three perspective. So jumping into um, governance uh, first, um, what we've released and uh, released to is a, uh, a legal service that helps with uh, compliance. It helps with the tagging of uh, data. So, you know, things like uh, country of origin, other countries where the data may have been processed. Um, these type of uh, tags you can, you can put on top of it, um, but it's, it's still sort of limited to a few attributes and the policy is actually evaluated by the legal service itself. And the improvements that we want to do to this service in release three is to improve the flexibility of the tagging. Uh, so you can, you can bring in additional attributes that may be relevant to you know, the country that you're operating in or corporate policies or, or things like that. And what that also means is if we um, increase the flexibility of the tagging, um, then we should also bring the same thing when it comes to the enforcement. So, which means we want to uh, move from a policy uh, coded in to more declarative policies and, and dynamic policy evaluation um, by the services. Um, where we are, uh, we're still sort of finalizing the requirements. Um, there's a couple of policy engines that we've been looking at. Um, and so the next uh, step is uh, an endorsement from the EA team to get this, uh, what will become an incubatory project uh, um, kicked off. So then let's move to ingestion. And uh, what we've accomplished in uh, release two is effectively the, the entire preparation phase is done outside the platform. Uh, and at the point when you ingest, we are also assuming that the ingestion would uh, transform the data into the OSD bill schema, if you will. Um, so the data loading itself was done through a bunch of uh, scripts and um, like I mentioned, it's limited to the OSDU or two data structures. Um, and we did a few sort of manual enrichments, if you will, to make sure that the data that is brought in uh, could uh, fit the needs for some of the search workflows uh, that were in place. What we're doing with R3 is we are moving this into a more composable ingestion framework, um, something that can support a directed acyclic graph. Uh, so you can actually plug in parsers, you can plug in pre and, and post uh, processing steps in your uh, ingestion pipeline. And, and this could then open up um, to the community, whether this is operators, SIs, ISVs, whatever, to build um, additional parsers or additional ingestion data flows, uh, if you will. Um, the ingestion framework itself, we have a prototype that is based on Apache Airflow. Um, the schema service was contributed by Schlumber J. And so both of them, we have a starting point from an R2 perspective. So this is what we're going to bring forward into R3. Let me take it to the next step. Um, we are also uh, collaborating, this was uh, last week, um, to, with the data definitions and the teams that are working on data loading and software development a la engineering itself. So that's what's going on in ingestion. Then moving on into uh, discovery, like I mentioned, we have an elastic based uh, indexing. Um, there's a, a number of functional improvements that we've done uh, over R1. Um, so for example, you know, new schemas, how the data gets automatically indexed, all of that is, is completely streamlined. Um, there were a few things that were impacting the uh, usability. Uh, so for example, mapping the data types between the OSDU format and what Elastic supports. Uh, and very specifically, you know, we have JSON documents that have uh, arrays and, and arrays of objects, uh, for example, or nested objects. 
uh, how do we then uh, do this from an elastic perspective, uh, you know, flattening techniques that may be uh, used. So uh, one of the techniques that we can do in R3 uh, is now that we have a data flow framework that supports induction and enrichment, um, we could think about uh, optimizing the mapping uh, for the index configuration as part of that uh, framework. Uh, so this is something that we're collaborating with data definitions, uh, the, um, the, the software development team and the Elastic um, so uh, longer term, you know, there are other things that we can do with respect to, you know, today we're doing basic property search, uh, but could we do, you know, semantic search or NLP or, you know, additional uh, capabilities, those, those could be, you know, improvements after uh, the, the, the basics are, are done as part of the R3 short term memory. Moving further a little bit uh, into enrichment. So, um, like I mentioned in R2, um, this was effectively done uh, outside as part of the, the scripts. Uh, so, when you brought in the data and, and you were bringing in data from, let's say, last file or CSV file or any other source for that matter, you were effectively generating a manifest that was uh, compatible with the OSD UR2 format. Um, so, in effect, the, the transformation and the enrichment of the data was happening through scripts. Uh, with release three, um, the, the, the same sort of data flow framework that we're using for addition uh, should help us with creating a, a DAG, a directed executed graph for the enrichment uh, phase as well. So this would then get triggered by the notification that comes from the storage service. So anytime that there is some new data that is uh, brought in into storage, uh, that would then trigger the enrichment and therefore your workflow will be able to transform the data into a form that is more conducive for discovery and consumption. Uh, we are also introducing uh, things that are very relevant to data flow, uh, such as frame of references uh, and the ability to transform data across frames of references. So think units, think uh, coordinate reference systems, a la CRS. Um, so if you're looking for data within a particular spatial region or you know, wells greater than 10,000 feet or something like that, but your data may be coming in with you know, feet and feet US and meter and so on. Uh, what these um, um, frame of reference services would let you do is as part of enrichment to bring the data into a, a homogeneous frame of reference that provides you discovery uh, or from a consumption standpoint to translate the data from one frame of reference to the other based on uh, what your application or consumption workflow Moving on into um, security, uh, with R2, uh, we now have OpenID um, connect-based authentication. Uh, so this is how we verify whether this is user or service account authentication into the system. Um, the entitlements or the data authorization itself is done through a, um, a basic access control list, so effectively defined data groups and user groups and the ACL basically is a um, intersection of, you know, which uh, user groups have access to which data groups, uh, if you will. Um, the um, services themselves support uh, encryption. So these are all TLS encryptions uh, all the way from the client application or service to the OSD data platform. So data is encrypted in flight. Um, and, and based on the choice of technologies that we've used for storage, the data uh, is also encrypted at uh, storage. Uh, for static analysis, um, this is uh, from a SAST uh, perspective. Um, we are uh, using some tools like um, uh, code bugs, uh, uh, for example. Uh, spot bugs and, and what that does is it, uh, as part of our uh, build pipeline. Um, to check for not only the, you know, the free code, but also look at it from a uh, static code analysis from a security standpoint. And uh, of course, the infrastructure um, itself is provided by the CSPs. And so what we've done is along with the CSPs, we've, we've looked at uh, hardening the um, uh, infrastructure uh, to be at least uh, developer ready for release two. Where we want to go with release three, is to move from basic ACLs to declarative policies, uh, 
so not only can we enforce um, security policies that way, we can enforce compliance policies that way. Uh, we want to bring in additional tests uh, from a security uh, standpoint to the CICD pipeline. So as the code evolves, we are uh, catching more of these issues uh, early, if you will. Uh, and of course, we are working with the InfoSec team to get those uh, requirements and, and try to see you know, what additional uh, tests we may need to put in here and uh, to draw the line between you know, what should the platform do from a code standpoint versus the responsibility of the managed service provider or the operator who's operating the system versus the, um, the cloud provider who's providing the um, infrastructure. So this is what we mean by a shared responsibility model, uh, and that will translate to more uh, CRISPR scope definition and specifically requirements for uh, the security components of the system. And again, these are things that you can go to uh, community.opengroup.org, go into platform under security. You see the, the current list of uh, issues they are prioritized with these things. <clears throat> Last but not the least, uh, operations. So certainly with R3, uh, we want to move from a, a developer ready release of R2 to something that is deployment ready from a release three perspective. So what that means is we need to think about um, CI and CD as two unique things. So the platform does the CI, the platform provides the basic scripts that's needed for CD, uh, but the deployment itself is happening in different environments uh, based on the, the different operators. Uh, so they should be able to hook in um, into their CD pipelines. Um, the deployment scripts that are coming from the platform. They should be able to hook in, um, you know, whether this is uh, monitoring uh, tools, telemetry tools, uh, operation support uh, tools uh, into the logs that are being pumped out from the platform. We're also looking at um, any out of the box tools that we can provide to help with uh, telemetry, you know, things like Prometheus, uh, for example, right? Um, we are also looking at uh, GitOps, uh, and and this is a, a technique where you know very similar to how we manage code from a, uh, a DevOps perspective, to look at the infrastructure and the operations themselves as code, and therefore those are version and those are also put into Git, and how a update into Git could then trigger a CD on the uh, operations uh, side. Of uh, so here again, there's uh, a, a work stream that's going on in, in R3 to look at uh, these type of requirements, disaster recovery, logging, performance, et cetera. And so we're waiting on additional input from that work stream to, um, uh, you know, crisp up the requirements for R3. Oh. Um, that's roughly um, the, the sort of uh, high level things in terms of the services. Uh, let's look at it from the data perspective. Uh, what we did in R2 for data is really it's covering the wells and the seismic uh, footprint as per the OSD data definition scheme. Um, and the storage itself is, um, you know, largely what I said before with a JSON store uh, and an optimized uh, file or a blob store that captures the rest of the data. Uh, the one place where we have more optimized access is with respect to uh, seismic trace data, uh, where we're using the OpenVDS uh, um, uh, library uh, to be able to provide optimized access to um, the seismic data. What we are doing with release three is sort of expanding on that, uh, formalizing this and setting up what is called a um, <clears throat> domain data management service um, something that can provide uh, type safe access for um, the different data types, uh, something that can provide optimized array access. Um, so, for example, if uh, imagine you're writing an application and you wanted to show uh, a cross section window where you're showing, uh, you know, five different wells and, and three different curve types and different channels uh, for a particular depth interval. You should be able to express that as a query and, and, and go after the individual log curves. Uh, rather than have to parse, uh, you know, last files or other uh, original files that may be capturing the uh, the array data. So those are the two things that the DDMS uh, tries to do. And I 
because there are uh, a few more uh, domains that we are looking at in, in R3. Uh, one is uh, uh, reservoir, the other one is uh, well delivery. So again, based on uh, where the data definitions team ends up and uh, the contributors come in for those two projects, uh, those may get uh, added uh, on top of R3 as well. Um, so we have worked with the data uh, to make sure that what they are uh, defining uh, will become the source for the code side of things. So they can become the, the JSON specifications for uh, these TDMSs, uh, if you will. And they also need to be linked into our test cases to make sure that when we make a release of the platform, that it's compliant with the, uh, the standards as set by the data definitions. So that is very quickly, you know, uh, a, a quick overview and, and contrast of, um, you know, where we were with each of the individual services in R2 versus R3. Now let's look at the API layer and, and see, you know, how can you consume this, understand a bit more of the API uh, landscape. So um, these are slides that were previously presented, so I'm going to go really fast on this. Um, but if there is any uh, questions, uh, we can we can take it at the end. We can come back and, and talk about the details. So the API itself is divided into um, really two big categories. One is the platform service and the other one is the data service. Uh, both of them have a footprint in R2. And uh, of course, these are improving in R3 based on the functional improvements that I covered in the previous slides. The data services are really related to the, the data flow side of things, whether this is the ingestion of data, the enrichment of data, the consumption or the delivery of data, or the services that go hand in hand with the, the ingestion from heterogeneous set of sources, such as handling frames of references like units and, and the whole. And the data service itself then depends on the core services of the platform. And the platform service is responsible for keeping track of the schema, keeping track of the identity of the objects, uh, keeping track of the metadata of the objects. And this is the one that helps you with uh, identity, versioning, lineage, context, uh, indexing, search, arguably indexing and search. Uh, a few people have mentioned, you know, isn't it related to a type of consumption a la data service? Uh, but the ability to discover something that you've stored is, is so, you know, primal, fundamental to the platform uh, that we would like to view that one um, as a platform service. And then last but not the least, uh, the, um, uh, the, the CI, uh, the CD scripts, uh, the uh, support for operations as we talked about. So those APIs that are really domain agnostic um, and enable both data flow and domain specific uh, capabilities or effectively the platform services. So jumping into a bit more detail on the uh, platform services, uh, what was delivered in R2 is a storage service. Um, you may have seen that uh, with the OpenDES contribution, there is a, a slight adjustment to how the schema uh, itself is captured. Uh, the data records also have a slightly different format uh, compared to R1. And on the security side, this is based on the ACL based uh, access control. And just to recap uh, on R3, um, you know, this is global deployment, um, updates to indexing and search, policy based uh, entitlements, and a new schema registration API. So if you're bringing in data from other sources and you want to bring in the data in source fidelity, now you have a convenience API to register and manage schemas. Uh, on the data side of things, um, pretty much this was all done through scripts outside the platform in R2. So effectively, these are you know, gonna be brand new APIs uh, in the uh, R3 sense. Um, so uh, the ingestion framework was um, sort of a, a prototype in the R2 sense. Uh, OpenVDS is the only one that's uh, really delivered as part of R2. Uh, with R3, you're seeing enhancements both to the framework side with respect to the ingestion and the enrichment framework. Um, we talked about domain data management services. So to provide a pluggable way of doing things, and I'll get into this a little bit more detail, 
Um, we will also have a DDMS registry. So, you know, it's easy to plug in new domains and domain specific services into the framework. Uh, likewise, the ingestion and the enrichment framework will support uh, DAGs that will allow us to plug in you know, parsers, new data types uh, into the framework. Then um, very quickly on, on uh, DDMS. So today what we have is a generic set of APIs, right? So if you go to storage or search, uh, you get a JSON document out and the structure of the JSON document is hopefully compliant with a schema. Um, but if you try to generate your client code, for example, uh, because those structures aren't baked into the definition of the APIs, uh, you're not going to get um, type safe uh, accesses, right? So, for example, if, if you generated a Java client library, for example, you're not going to have an entity called a well. You're going to have an entity called an entity uh, whose uh, you know kind is a well, and it's basically effectively think of it as a name value pair bag of uh, values, right? So it's good, it's flexible, it's the foundation that we need, um, but it it's not possible to bring in those additional semantics and the, the type safety that is necessary to build robust applications that can run natively on top of it. And that's what the DDMS does. It brings the semantics, it brings a type safe API, and it also provides optimized array accesses. So from a consumption standpoint, you don't have to think about this as an export or a delivery of the, the, the source data, but one that can actually give you the relevant chunks of the array data uh, that has been, um, you know, enriched and, and digested from the different sources from which it was used. Which APIs uh, should you use? So, of course, everybody should know how the uh, the core platform itself works. So, everything that is related to the, um, the platform service, if you will, how the authentication works, how the search works, how storage works, how delivery works. Uh, how compliance works, uh, those are things that everybody should uh, know. Um, and uh, if you are an author of a new type or you want to connect the OSDU platform to a new source, um, then you may need to know a few more things. So you may need to know how the ingestion framework works. How can you plug in your parser into the ingestion framework? Uh, how can you build a DAG using pre post process steps? Uh, how does the um, the security of the system work from an entitlements perspective, from a compliance perspective, so we can tag and enforce the uh, the data properly? Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, if the source of data that you're bringing in is is with different frames of references, then how do you use the helper uh, functions to um, either process the data during enrichment for a homogeneous discovery? or to make those available in your consumption workflows within the applications uh, to transform it to how the user wants to consume it in their work. <clears throat> okay, so then um, let's look at a few more use cases. Um, if you are looking at building an application or providing uh, enrichment services, you know, data quality, uh, classification, or other types of um, uh, curation of data that can bring in uh, transformed and, and higher value data out. Uh, you may want to look at the enrichment framework and how you can plug in again um, work steps within the, the framework to react to notifications of specific input types and be able to transform them, extract them, match, map, merge, classify, curate, if you will, to bring the data into an enriched form and tying it back to the data principles. Of course, you're writing this back as a uh, newer instance of the data with the appropriate lineage pointing back to the source data that you had uh, basically improved upon. Um, so the consuming user or the application has the relevant context of the lineage and, and what transforms have happened on that piece of data. Um, and of course, you would look at the, um, the domain uh, object uh, uh, management service APIs to register uh, your DDMS. So if you want to bring in a new domain, so for example, Energistics and Emerson are looking at uh, bringing in um, reservoir domain. Schlumberger uh, and EPAM are looking at uh, the well delivery domain. So if those domains um, have optimized uh, array accessors, type safe accessors, and you want to package them into a DDMS, 
you will look at the, uh, the, the DMS APIs to register and link in those. Uh, and of course, you need to make sure that you're using all the, the platform APIs uh, shown here as code APIs uh, to make sure that you register your schemas, you register the identity of your objects, you make enough metadata available so it's indexed, it's, it's searchable and you tag the data from a uh, entitlements and the compliance perspective. So any new domains that we bring in still follows the same cross-cutting principles of the overall OSDA platform. And um, last but not the least, if you are a SI, if you are an administrator of the system, if you are responsible for operations, um, then these are some of the APIs that you have after uh, entitlements, uh, compliance, and again with R3, you will also have the uh, policy-based um, definitions of compliance and, and entitlements. So how you can uh, define and modif modify the policies as needed for your deployment environment. And then uh, if you have, uh, you know, specific tools, um, you know, maybe a company is uh, subscribed to Splunk, uh, for example, then how do you then route those uh, logs uh, into those type of enterprise tools that you may have for your operations monitoring, your um, uh, telemetry and insight support, um, how you want to notify the uh, users. So those are all the things that you may want to look at. And again, the, the platform will provide you the capabilities around uh, logging information, telemetry information, notifications on new and changed data items um, that you can then react to and, and hook it up into the other tools that you may have uh, set up in your enterprise. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for the different services in the platform, uh, where we are with R2, what are some of the work that's going on with R3, uh, what the API landscape is, and again, the two broad categories, the platform services and the data services, uh, and in particular, where these DDMSs uh, fit in in an R3 timeframe. And hopefully the last few slides gave you uh, an overview of, um, you know, based on your persona and what you're trying to do with OSDU, uh, what are some of the APIs uh, that's targeted towards you and, and how you can benefit from it. So if you want to learn uh, more, uh, what do you do? Uh, so a couple of options. Uh, there is a application developer uh, bootcamp um, that uh, EPAM had organized. Uh, there could be additional sessions of that that could be created. Um, we are also contemplating a platform developer bootcamp. So this would be to join um, the PMC uh, group uh, in one of the projects as a active uh, contributor. Uh, and of course, this is also a pitch uh, from my side, uh, from a PMC standpoint, uh, to all of you to, you know, look into your organization, uh, to look at, uh, you know, who could be a good resource to help become a uh, contributor. And of course, the best way to learn the ins and out of the system is uh, to actually join the, the development of the platform itself and become an active uh, contributor and then, you know, eventually even leading up to becoming an active uh, committer uh, within the uh, platform. So uh, hopefully that gives you a, a flavor for uh, a overview of the OSD data platform and uh, you know what are some of the principles the overall functional architecture apis and, and so on uh, like i said let me reiterate and, and close by saying you know appreciate if you can uh, bring in additional contributors to the system uh, at this point we have more requirements than what our current contributor pool can handle uh, so any helping hand that you can provide there is really good um, and again this is the first in the series of these data platform architecture series. Uh, the next one is going to be two weeks from now, uh, presented by Google, and that's going to cover the new uh, ingestion framework that is coming in in the R3 timeframe. So that should leave us uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes or so, Dennis, for any uh, questions uh, from you. Raj, uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I was wondering whether the well-known entity uh, will be included in R3 uh, timeframe, so you can merge the data from different sources with different schema. Yeah, so 
So the uh, enrichment framework will certainly support that, uh, Philip. Uh, mm -hmm. So first step that we want to go to is uh, what's a well-known schema. So meaning if I loaded a well from, you know, Petrel or OpenWorks or NP, whatever, uh, to be able to enrich it into the standard OSDU structure so I can look at all my wells through a single lens. Um, and then perhaps after we've reached that milestone, the next phase could be, okay, now that you have this, how do you then rationalize potential duplicate instances and authoritative instance a la the WKE? Hey, Philip, can you hear me? It's Jay. Yep. Um, yeah, so for the Energistics projects, which obviously is going to be the first well-known entities being defined publicly in the system, we have two alternatives. We can... Uh, go map uh, in our ingester or our ingestion process between the incoming file format so that what gets loaded into OSDU is already uh, in the schema of the OSDU JSON documents. And we're talking about only that small number of attributes. Or we do have the option under open desk from Schlumberger to simply load a WhatsML well exactly as it is. Uh, in, mm -hmm. in the, and then, but that wouldn't be in the OSDU namespace. It would be in an energistic or a shell namespace or an energistics namespace. Mm -hmm. Then do an enrichment process to convert that later, yes. uh, to convert yes. that into uh, the OSDU format. So that has a big advantage and a big disadvantage. The big advantage is I now have that document uh, available in JSON in a, a document store. I could choose for the indexing service to notice that it's there or choose not to have the indexing service mm -hmm. notice that it's there. Uh, uh, and, and that's a really good thing. Plus the document would come with all of its attributes, not just the tiny set of attributes that are defined in the yeah. OSDU data model. So that seems like a good thing until you realize that now all of a sudden you're going to have this chaos of hundreds of different styles of JSON documents and, and that seems very chaotic. So while the Slumberger donated code supports that for lots of workflows, it may be that OSDU as a community will choose that they don't want that to happen, that they want to see data right when it appears in the OSDU document store mm -hmm. as uh, it's already been subsetted down to that set of things uh, that that are in the schema and has been translated into those words and then but then the the full document would go into a well related uh, domain specific data management store right so you still you still never lose the data right the question is how much of it makes its way so to me uh, that's an osdu forum decision yes. so whether how they would like that to work but that decision is key to what uh, it's well, it's key to what Energistics is doing. It's also really key to what we're doing on the data loading, data prep and loading team, yeah. because uh, there's three possibilities. You do the mapping before the data appears at OSDU, you do the mapping mm -hmm. in the ingestion pipeline, mm -hmm. or you do the mapping after the fact, after you've yeah. put foreign data into the document store. So I'd like Raj to comment, but I think what I, everything I said, I think is correct. And, and open desk allows all of the above. All of the above. Uh, and so, but the OSDU forum, uh, in order to make a standard that's going to kind of guarantee the kind of interoperability uh, and and marketability, if you will, of a solution, uh, okay. could could choose to say we want that mapping to happen during the ingestion pipeline, which will be talked about in two weeks. So, Rob, would you make a remark? Yeah. So, so uh, thanks. Uh, Did I say anything wrong? No, no, no. Uh, let me let me let me make a few comments. So uh, yes, in fact, uh, with R two, uh, effectively the the first mode is is what you said, right? Meaning, the processing of the data, the extraction, the transformation to an OSDU schema or a, a manifest file, is happening outside the system, right? So yeah. if the OSDU system evolves, and we want to mm -hmm. now bring in a new attribute into the mix, if you will. Um, you know, unless you know what your source is and, and hopefully you can reach it at the point uh, that happens, um, the system will not be able to sort of auto upgrade and evolve its, its model uh, in, in that sense, right? So yeah. um, that is the reason why, just to reemphasize what is ingestion versus enrichment, the idea was to say, okay, look, I want to bring in the data with the source fidelity. So once I've brought this data into the platform, I do not have a reliance on 
the source file or source database or source web service or whatever as the system continues to evolve. And your mm -hmm. OSD data model uh, becomes more uh, richer over time with attributes, relationships, et cetera. Effectively, what you're doing is you're rerunning an enrichment to then process that input data, if you will, and then generate the um, OSDU perspective of the data for uh, consumption. And what that also allows you to do is to keep track of the lineage. And because the enrichment is not some random Python script that somebody's running outside the platform, you can actually say that, okay, this OSDU well uh, was actually generated from this WitsML file. And this is the specific DAG routine that we ran to uh, generate this. And, and that sort of um, a context brings uh, trust uh, in, in a user to know, okay, am I going to trust this information more than something else and what processing has uh, happened on top of the data. With respect to the, um, the pool of data and, and how to make sense out of it, so that's where the entitlements comes in. So uh, a lot of cases, uh, at least, you know, now wearing my Schlumberger hat rather than the PMC hat. Um, some of the commercial customers of this, the way they do it is uh, through the entitlements, right? So you would basically say that the source data is entitled to the curators of the data, you know, think data managers, think IT type people. And then you effectively provide access to only the, the well-known schema to the end user. So that way you're providing uh, good quality uh, standardized uh, data for consumption. Uh, but from a management standpoint, you have a, a single platform, a single place where you can uh, manage and, and curate all of this uh, information together. But you could choose to do the reverse, like I said. You could choose for the indexing service to index data that is not yet in OSDU format. That's correct. So the indexing service today does not discriminate. Um, so if you have uh, schemas from other namespaces, it will index all of them, but the ability to retrieve anything, including the index, is driven based on the entitlements. So if um, I say Jay is a data manager, so he can see the Energistics uh, namespace uh, data, but Philip is an end user and therefore he can only see the OSDU one, uh, from Philip's standpoint, that's the only thing that even exists in the index. Uh, maybe maybe I'd like to uh, uh, ask Doc to uh, uh, kind of take this issue back to data definition subcommittee uh, for some discussion uh, to provide some guidelines. We've actually talked about this okay. issue in, in data definitions, but remember there's many data definitions calls, but right. uh, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, and Doug, please jump in, but uh, the data definitions crowd is waiting for this deeper dive into the details of oh, okay. how the ingestion pipeline. It's okay. it, without really having the uh, uh, the next level of detail of what services are there now. What services okay. do we think we're going to develop? Energistics will probably develop a few. You know, Mikhail and CGI guys will probably develop a few. You know, as we identify things that are needed, we may spin up tiny PMC projects to add little services into the core. You know, but uh, but uh, Doug, is, is that a fair statement of where we're at? We're kind of waiting for the, for everyone to get on the same level of knowledge. Yeah, I think it is, Jay. I, I don't know if we've said that explicitly, but we certainly are kind of forming our understanding right now and aren't really able to a answer those questions, Philip, until we so, do. Get so that. two weeks from now, uh, we are uh, very excited to hear about uh, ingestion pipeline. Uh, then after that, uh, I think data definition subcommittee can have a good discussion on on, on this uh, the very issue. Yeah, I think I, but a lot of these workflow things belong to Mikhail van der Haven. They belong to the data prep and loading team. That's kind of the way it's fallen yeah. out in the within the data definition subgroups. Is that Mikhail's group, which I'm on, so I can say we. Doug's on it, so we can all say we, because all the same ones are on a lot of the same subcommittees. But okay. but but the, but the truth is, you know, rather than having the people doing well delivery worrying about this, uh, it, it either belongs to core concepts or the data loading. And I think it's pretty much James has pretty much driven it that. Uh, that particular thing is in the data load, data prep and loading team. So if people have energy around that, join our calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which are when I think Wednesdays. 
probably should also encourage the data loading team to join the next architecture series. Oh yeah, we'll be letting everybody, we need to let everybody know about that. The data loading calls are at, are at 9 a.m. Houston time on Wednesday. So if people want to join those, uh, please do. Also, questions, guys. In this team, uh, we we saw that uh, the problem will be re really uh, the data preparation and the status of the data preparation when we want to ingest it. I think that's the main problem we have for the time being. For example, it could be very easy for us to ingest a RESTQL file which is uh, generated by Paradigm or by uh, Schlumberger which already respect the rules, and then after we can inject the thing. The same way we can really ingest easily something which exists somewhere in the PPDM environment and on which we can after apply the rules. Because by example, when we are looking all the data, they are so inconsistent that it could be necessary to pass in a software before going to the, uh, to the ingestion part. This data preparation is a very big uh, challenge now. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, uh, Jean Francois. So th that's that's also the reason why we want to make sure that um, you know those type of manifest generation one is not manual and and two isn't done outside the platform. So if we needed to you know redo that, we don't have to you know go after wherever we ended up uh, dropping these uh, scripts and manifests at the point when we initially loaded that data. Uh, Raj, can, where can we find this PowerPoint after a meeting? Yeah, so I, I, in the chat window, I've, I've put in a, a link. This is a uh, community uh, wiki page link um, that contains the, um, the different topics that will come in this architecture series. Um, so I have already linked the slide in there. I don't see it in the chat, Raj. Yeah, it's not in the chat. It is not in the chat? Yeah. My chat is empty. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt your flow, Raj, but that wasn't there. <laughs> I can see it. Really? I've, I've gone to the link, Jay. <clears throat> My chat is empty. That's interesting. Okay. So if you if you go under platform, there is a new uh, uh, folder called enterprise architecture, and then under wikis, you will see this is where the topics are. Okay. Okay. And you see the slide is uh, already attached, and we also have the the slides for the next one. But you know, hang on to it until uh, okay. this has uh, actually done the uh, the presentation uh, two weeks from now. And I'm also working with uh, Judy and Dennis to get these recordings uploaded yes. to YouTube. So we will also put a link in here. Yeah. Uh, then if you actually want to hear the speaker and you missed the session, you have a, a way to replay it later. Excellent, yeah. Thank you so much, Raj. Yeah, no problem, guys. Thanks, Thanks for joining uh, this morning. Uh, have a good day.